welcome everyone. Um, so before we get into it, I wanted to point out uh, that for Thursday's class, there's a TED talk to watch. Remember the uh, finalized hypothesis and pilot study is due on Saturday. And also I'm gonna point out, uh, Corey from earlier in the semester is going to be doing his robot improv show on Friday. Though I encourage you, if you have time starting at 3.30 Mountain to sign up, uh, there's a, in the Discord, there's a link to where you can sign up and watch him and his part, I believe partner do improv with their robot. Later in the semester, I'll try to get him back to talk about that technology. But for today, I'm really excited to introduce my friend Avi. Um, we probably <laughs> met each other in the mid 2000s. You graduated one year before me and we are both um, excited about teaching and in both, it seems like enjoy virtual teaching. So he is, uh, Avi is, um, has background in human computer interaction, but also explainability. And he recently wrote a few articles and papers related to that. So I invited him here to talk about explainability, which I'm super excited about. Well, thank you so much for that great intro. And and just to pass the, the favor back the other way, I actually have really enjoyed listening to Matt talk uh, whenever I remember always like looking him out and for his lectures whenever he's at a conference because he also gets super excited like I do about whatever it is and he's passionate about uh, AI and technology and a particular reinforcement learning, but uh, other things too. Uh, but uh, it's always a pleasure to be here and to meet his class. So. Without further ado, um, I'd like to get going, but I also want to stress that the thing that distance learning or any of these Zoom things is, please, please, please ask questions. Please uh, give me your thoughts. Please stop me at any point because otherwise I feel like I'm just talking to a wall. And even though a bunch of you have videos on, I still would love uh, any questions or comments or anything that you'd like to share with me. Um, so today uh, I'd like to talk with you a little bit about explainability. And the way the paper was organized that I wrote, uh, and the way I'm going to organize this talk, and Matt, just correct me if I'm wrong, well, we're talking about half an hour plus some questions or something like that, right? And just take it based on how things go, right? Yeah, we, we've got a total of 80 minutes, um, and we okay. can go as, as long as you want, or if, okay. if questions peter out, we absolutely don't need to, to fill the time. Okay. So, so let, let's have some fun. So uh, by fun, I mean, let's, let's talk about a whole bunch of issues related to explainability. And we'll stop with, start with some uh, um, definitions. Uh, there are a lot of terms being thrown around in the, in the field right now, transparency, interpretability, fairness, explainability. And one of the things that really motivated me for uh, writing this paper, and I still see it going on, is that there's, there's some, I, uh, I would say, ambiguity sometime about some of these terms. And, and I just really wanted to get some sharper definitions for those things. So we'll start with that. And then we'll use those definitions for talking about aspects ex of explainability. Why are they important? Who's the target? What are the explanations based on? Uh, when should we present those things? And how do you evaluate them? And the key takeaway is that all these issues are going to be intertwined. So when you ever think about explainability from this point, I want you really thinking about, you know, what are your definitions for what are you defining as explainability? And then all the issues of why, who, what, when, and how. So let's get into this a little bit more. Um, explainability is becoming a really big issue, especially in anything that involves with people. Uh, the cars are just one of the most fascinating thing to me because even though I think we're getting to the point where self-driving cars are more accurate, more, more safe than a human, what happens when it kills someone? And then the question is, why did it kill someone? And what do you do about that? And is there a legal requirement to do something about that? And, and just all the fallout from that becomes very, very interesting. Uh, without getting to anything so extreme, you can have things like robots that interact with people and how they interact with them, tutoring systems, which are very human-based recommendation systems, chatbots, and digital assistants. And what's interesting also is these things are taking on a little bit of a uh, life of their own. The EU has the GDPR, the General Data Protection Regulation, I think is what it stands for, where it requires, at least in theory, for any computer system to tell you at the will of any legislator, what is it deciding and why? 
and so why that's becoming very, very critical. Yeah, Matt, so, you had a question? So la last week, um, we actually had a guest lecture by someone talking about intelligent tutoring systems. So okay. I, I, I could see how explanations are important in self-driving cars. Why are they important for ITSs? Yes, well, I actually joke that there are good questions and then there are great questions. A good question is one that the person speaking knows the answer to. A great question is one that the lecturer actually has a slide built in one of the <laughs> upcoming slides. Right. So that is a great question, Matt. Uh, <laughs> now, it, it really boils down to why do you need an explanation in the first place and what is the point to it? And then the question becomes what is an ITS and what does that have to do and where does it factor in? So we do have a slide that will focus on that a little bit more, but um, I don't think my great slide is next, meaning the slide that I actually addressed that point isn't the next slide. So it's a great question, but um, I think it's three slides from where we are right now. I don't remember the slides by heart, you'll forgive me. But um, the first point I wanted to do is just lay down some groundwork about definitions. Um, there is a lot of buzz about explanations. I would say other than neural networks uh, and deep learning, this is actually becoming quickly one of the hottest topics of the AI field simply because um, it's starting to become legislated. And people are throwing around terms without necessarily having a consensus about what they're saying. And even that EU's GDP explainability they're actually looking for. And a lot of times where you have these legislators, they're saying things without, you know, a deep technical understanding of the AI systems. So it's not clear what consensus is. And some researchers even are using terms of like explainability, interpretability, transparency, synonymously, and sometimes they're not. And it often becomes a community thing, which research community you're talking to, which uh, body you're dealing with, and sometimes they're talking about things in the same way and sometimes they're not. Uh, the general rule of thumb we have on this slide is that in the human agent community where I come from, we typically talk about explainability, and that's why the talk is about explainability, but um, in machine learning communities, they often talk about interpretability. Uh, they're often talking about exactly the same thing. But I wanted to create some type of uh, definitions. So here's my suggestion. And I like when I give this talk saying, these are my suggestions. Some people agree with them. Some people disagree with them. But this is the way I look at the AI landscape. And um, you know, this is just meant to be a, a starting point. So the general rule of thumb is explanations are for people meaning I am a person, I work with a computer system, I need an explanation from you, the computer system. The interpretation is something more technical. It has to do with the logic of the machine learning algorithm. And transparency is going to be something that involves terms of explicit and faithful that I'm about to define right here. So let me just breeze through some of these things right here real quick. Oh, sorry. Uh, let me take out my little laser virtual printer. So we have here a feature. A feature is simply just something that we're going to learn from. A record, of course, is the collection of all the features for a given a data collection, like a picture or a row in the data sheet. And we're assuming here, at least in this talk, that I'm dealing with um, supervised data, that you have a target. Um, an algorithm is going to be your machine learning algorithm. And the interpretation is going to be something that takes all these inputs and gives me the representation of the logic of the internal system. So an interpretation, at least according to this slide and according to this uh, way of looking at the world, is something that basically takes the input and tells me how the algorithm got to the output that it got. It's not necessarily something uh, beyond that mathematical uh, connection, and it's typically something that's very technical. On the other hand, the explanation is something that's a little bit more human-centric. I want to understand what the system is doing, so I need an explanation that's typically going to be a little bit more uh, general or understandable or something like that. And then when we talk about uh, transparency, I'm sorry, let's, let's go one at a time. So when I talk about explicitness, uh, it's whether or not the logic, the interpretation, is understandable, is explicitly understood by the intended user. So I have a bunch, I have a logic that the system created. I need to understand what it is. And the question is how explicit it is, how that user really understood what's going on. Fairness, of course, is a really, really important issue, which is that there's a lack of bias in the internal logic. Uh, 
I, I was actually speaking with a banker, and this is like a huge problem. Many times banks will make decisions about loans. And of course, they're using all the data that they have, all the features that they have, and all the records that they have. And they'll flag things that are somewhat questionable, like inner city, whatever, uh, typically don't give back the full amount of the loan in their certain areas. And then they can create a model, which is not fair, and say all people that are from a certain geographic location are not as likely to give back their loans. And then the question really becomes, what features have you been using? And that in turn will decide whether or not that model is really being fair. And that, and then we'll talk about this in a few more slides, is really problematic with certain uh, machine learning models because they're not necessarily fair because they're learning from everything on equal footing and they'll create whatever model they're creating. And they might use things like gender, age, ethnicity, geographic location when you don't necessarily want them to be doing those things. And Avi, when, when you're talking about fairness, are you just talking about the inputs or are you talking about the effect of the overall system? Right. So according to the slide, I'm only talking about inputs, but you okay. could have more complicated things. We're taking a even the more basic approach that is just inputs. And by the way, I spoke with a banker from the EU and they said, yeah, they're definitely doing it. Even just on the very basic input level, they are definitely making mortgage decisions based on things that would not be considered fair according to their own GDPR. OK, and, and if you're using a uh, complex model of any form, neural networks, whatever they may be, you're not going to be fair according to this. Um, faithfulness is whether or not the logic of your interpretation, what you're giving off, you're passing off as the agent's model, model sorry, is really what is happening inside. And a lot of what's happening in the field is you have in the machine learning community people generating interpretations, at least what we consider interpretations by this uh, slide, and they're not always identical to uh, the logic inside. I don't know how many of you have heard about things like proxy models or things like that, where you have like a different model making the explanation versus what's making the decision, and that actually could be criminal uh by the g g because you're basically creating one model for the logic and a different model for the actual explanation or interpretation that can become very very uh dangerous literally uh justification is why the user should accept the logic of the agent and it's not necessarily going to be faithful i'm sorry faithful is the extent that they are the same but justification is why the user should accept that and it's not necessarily faithful it doesn't necessarily have any connection i'll give you an example of what i mean um, if i say this system is 99 percent accurate so you should accept the system that might be a good justification but it's not really a good interpretation or a good explanation and a lot of times uh, we as AI practitioners use justification much more than we use uh, explanations. Meaning when I say it, you should believe this image processing system because it's almost never wrong, that's justification, but it's not necessarily an explanation. So we have to be very, very careful what we're talking about. And transparency, at least according to this slide, is a very specific subset of all these things where the agent's logic and the agent's explanation are this one of the same, or in other words, you're both explicit and faithful, that you have a complete connection between the logic being passed off and the logic that's actually being used. And for better or for worse, most systems are actually not transparent. And that's something we're gonna talk about. So this is a lot of things to um, unpack, but let's try to see it in a little bit more visual way of looking at things. So let's say I'm here and I'm the age, I'm the human, and I want to understand. So I want to understand what's going on inside of the agent. This big circle is everything that's going on inside this agent. And the agent can have at its disposal many, many different ways of explaining what's going on inside of it. It could have transparent models where it has some type of link between the machine learning and the explanation that is generating. It could have a whole bunch of visualization tools, which are very, very popular. 
it could have things which are called outcome tools that just show you what the outcome is and why. And it can have other things like model tools or feature analysis and prototyping tools. And we'll talk about some of these in the next few minutes. So you have a whole bunch of different possibilities. And the question then becomes, how is the explanation being generated? And is it really uh, being generated for what needs to be? Done. So the really the next question is, and this is what I think Matt was going on, uh, are they really important? Are they somewhat helpful or are they not necessarily even needed? And this slide, I claim at least, Matt, uh, despite what uh, the last week's speaker said, I think, that in the ITS system, part of the learning process is to explain why the system is doing what it's doing and that the explanation can be a fundamental part of the learning process. Uh, I think I might be contradicting last week's speaker though by saying that. No, no, that's not a contradiction, but I think, so you're talking about, can you can the ITS explain the solution to the problem, not can the ITS explain to the student why it's being shown this problem or why the difficulty right. is increasing in a certain way. Right. So okay. yes, I think what you're saying is there are different functions an ITS have. I'm looking more at the ITS needs to explain where I went wrong, let's say, and in order for me to understand where I went wrong, then I really have to understand the logic of the agent because I don't understand the logic. So I need the agent to tell me it's logic or else I haven't gained anything for understanding where I went wrong. So in that type of case, it's critical. There are other functions of ITSs which might be different. And I guess that really is what the point of the slide is. It, what is the function of the system and what part of it is uh, being addressed by the explanation. Let's say I have a service robot. I have my little Roomba walking around and it keeps on making mistakes. So it might be helpful if it gives me logic why it's doing what it's doing so I'm more likely to trust it, but it might not be critical, right? The Roomba can just do what it's doing no matter what. Um, then you have things where you have some nice good to have type things that the, you have some knowledge acquisition or support and there might be some added bank gain from it. But however, you have many, many, many systems going on like the self-driving cars, which are very black box, meaning you don't fully understand what's going on. You're not necessarily expected to understand what's going on. And then the question is, can you just trust it because it's really, really accurate anyway? Uh, I'm not the first person to be asking these questions. Like I mentioned earlier, the EU is getting into the act. The UK is getting into the act. Uh, North America is very not into the act, for better or for worse. Uh, Israel is starting to get into the act, but very, very slowly. It really depends on the country that you're in uh, and, and what the legislation is in being involved. And, and getting to strengthen the question about the ITS, uh, Matt, there are six possible reasons why I put explanations down on this slide right to justify your definite your decision so that the human person may want to accept it more safety concerns so that you want to guarantee some type of safety concern is being met uh, to build trust and in ITS I think that would be a really important thing uh, and then you have the question of the the fairness the ethical the legal decision and that has to do with my example with the banks whether or not they're really using correct logic for denying or approving someone's loan. You have scientific discovery, which is actually something that I've been doing like cancer diagnosis. Could you really find why cancer is happening? And if you have a model that's explainable, then you actually have an understanding of what's going on in a better type of way. Uh, and it could just be to understand what's going on with this agent. You have an agent is making decisions and um, you have sometimes agents making decisions that are questionable. And if you understand the logic, uh, you have the ability to evaluate what's going on. I don't know, Matt, if you've talked about adversarial type scenarios where you have uh, trying to break the system or, or like, you know, you have a machine learning system that did image processing and you put a little sticker on the stop sign and it turns the stop sign into something completely different. Uh, and in theory, an explainable system would overcome these types of things. Um, oh, that's that's interesting because I've, I've seen adversarial talks on explainability. So by uh, so let me see if I can reconstruct this there. Basically, yeah, they sure. they had a biased system on purpose and then uh, they showed that uh, by by tweaking the data set slightly, Lime was able to come up with explanations that uh, did not find the bias. Um, but think, thinking about if if I want my my machine to do something bad, 
then maybe I can come up with bogus explanations. Or um, if if I have a machine, maybe I can give it certain data so that the explanation it uh, generates is incorrect. Right. All, yes to all of the above. And and <laughs> and and um, I, I heard you're using Lime. Are all the students familiar with Lime too? No, I have not mentioned that word before. Oh, okay. Because I have a slide with Lime, okay. uh, so so we can talk about Lime real briefly too. Uh, and and um, I actually have very mixed feelings about Lime itself, but that will explain why I have mixed feelings about Lime too. I think it's an it's great for what it's great for, and it's not. I think it sometimes is overused, is what I'm saying. But, and but sometimes people, yeah, go ahead. No, no, it has citations. It has lots of citations. It must no, be correct. That. <laughs> so the truth is, part of, one of the major things uh, I, I actually claim, at least in this slide, is it could be 99.9% .9 accurate, but it still might be illegal. And that's actually this little bullet here. Uh, could someone here come up with a, a suggestion, a real world uh, scenario where you have a system that's literally nearly 100% uh, accurate and everyone loves it and everyone cites it and it might actually be illegal to use it? Anyone? No one's watched the Terminator movies? I'm, I'm joking. But uh, uh, a real world scenario, something like that, that someone would, would take a stance might be illegal to use something. No? Matt, you want to take a stab at it? What would you say? I immediately go to something, something with bias in it. Um, so that's you know discriminating against people based on their skin color. Sure. Um, but but I've also been thinking a lot about the or not a lot thinking some about the trolley problem and sure. how if you know if you had a car that's right 99% of the time, but anytime it sees this kind of person it's going to veer and hit the pedestrian. Right. So, so I would say generally, any life or death situation that's right 99.9% .9 of the time might inherently be problematic because then you start talking about moral questions. Um, I don't know if all of you know Matt's uh, trolley problem, but you have a self-driving car that could either kill three people or one, and the one is the driver, at least in one of the ways of saying it. Should, so should the car kill you, you the user, or should it kill other people? And that's really a sticky questions. So I don't know if you um, guys are familiar with Cynthia Rudin's work in general. She's a big explainability person. And she wrote a, an article in Nature about this, which literally is entitled, Stop Explaining Machine Box, Black Box Machine Learning Models for High Stakes Decisions and Use Interpretive Models instead, which she basically, that, that basically sums up the, the main idea behind the paper, which is, you know, this is illegal to do, please stop doing this. Uh, and then you get into some of the um, questions like Asimov's laws of AI and like preventing the Terminator scenarios. And, and I was actually talking with my kids that, you know, if people really take this seriously, you actually would have a non-starter with all these things too. So it doesn't have to be extreme like life or death of the planet. It could just be life or death for a patient of a medical system or life or death for the person in the car. But then you have to really think about what you're doing and why. And Cynthia is actually coming and giving a talk at U of A, uh, I think in December. So I'm, I'm so, really excited. I've never actually met her. So I haven't met her either, but I'm, I'm, I'm a fan of her work. And um, when she comes, you can think about this talk if you go to it, because I'm sure she'll, she'll have some interesting things to say. So one, uh, one, yeah, go ahead. Sorry, one, one last quick comment on this is sure. this slide is another reason you might find explainability important is because it helps sales. Or could help sales, so that's that's slightly different than trust. It's not the same as trust, you think? I don't think so. I think it's a shiny feature uh, that may or may not be directly useful, and may or may not increase trust. I think then you might be in justification land because you're saying this is a good system because I can give you an explanation for it. But then yes. the explanation might be very different than the explanation you need for other reasons too. Okay. Uh, and to be quite honest, uh, and by the way, I don't think all these are mine. I mean, these have been all the ideas that other people have been bouncing around, but but you're right. If it's six versus seven, it's, that's not really the major point here either way. Um, who's the target? And this becomes a really sticky thing. Matt mentioned before Lime. And um, the reason why I dislike Lime is not because I dislike Lime. 
And Lime is a great system. The reason why I dislike Lime is because Lime is a very technical explanation form. It's very algorithmic. It's very, very hard for normal humans to understand. And the question really is, who's the, who's the target? Is your target some type of scientific or legal expert? Is it, are they a computer scientist? Are they just a regular user? Are they an experienced user? And what difference would it make actually would be this Lyme question that I'm kind of talking about. So because we've already talked about it, it's mostly about the quality or quantity, what is being generated, what is the format, what is the interface, um, what is explicit. Explicit means does the intended user understand? And the question then becomes who's your intended user and did they really get the message of what they're trying to get? Uh, and these will be all things that are very, very important. And um, this slide tries oh, to get so I, I, want to, I want to interrupt for a second. Um, sure. does, does someone want to unmute and um, mention oh, the the thing about can you could someone else just steal your system if it's too explainable? Uh, yeah, so <clears throat> uh, Matt was saying that it might be a selling point that um, you have an explainable system and you might be able to help drive sales because of that. But if your system is too explainable, and it becomes uh, too much of a simple rule and people might just use the explanation instead of your system. Right. And I can tell you with experience in medical systems, um, they will not explain what the basis of their model is before they have patents on every single piece of that explanation because then they lose their justification for marketing that. But then after they have the patents, they're not, they're very happy to do it. So then you have a real, tricky scenario where you might not want to provide your explanation until you've given yourself legal protection after you be, meaning yeah yeah a, a lot of the things um I, and i'm just going to use the examples from medicine that i know of, like there's this test called oncotype which tells someone if they have an aggressive form of cancer or not uh they patent into every marker before they started giving out the explanations of what was going on because otherwise you can't just give that out into the public domain because your explanation is useless if you just say, look for this or whatever it is. Uh, so yeah, it's a very important point. Uh, and you have to think about things from the business aspect as well. And I'm not really a good business person. I'm, I'm an academic and I say, yeah, yeah, go, go, go explanations. But you have to understand what the theoretical business repercussions are of that too. And I think part of that is also why the justification approach right, is the more common one that's going to satisfy the EU because you don't really have to give the true logic behind the system. You just have to give something that says, listen, I'm really doing the right thing overall, so please, you know, just go with the flow. Uh, but I think it's a very important point. But if you really want to create transparent systems, the ones that really link the two inherently and completely, then you do have a very big business question. And, and it also goes back to uh, sometimes businesses don't want to patent things; they want to make them trade secrets. So, right. for for instance, if there's if there's one particular analysis that you can do, and that becomes a feature that is key to your business, then even if you uh, you patent it, if someone else then sees that and uses it, you can't, and maybe you can't detect that they're using it, and now all of a sudden you've completely lost your competitive edge. And that is going to be the legality issue behind this, because I can only imagine what happens if someone says, do not use certain prediction models. OK, and we'll get to that in the next one. If I say I am going to outlaw neural networks tomorrow. Yeah, that's going to go over real well with Facebook, Google and uh, NVIDIA. They're going to have a fun time with that one. And even if I say you should do that, I, and I could make a argument because the argument that I'm going to make in the next slide but it starts here is that you have certain models where which are inherently more faithful and you have certain models which are inherently more explicit and the only ones that are faithful that are really really linked to the logic and really really understandable are those that are transparent and all these other possibilities that are being uh, floated as ways of generating explainability feature analysis models prototype analysis visualization tools all of them, fall short. Either they're less explicit, they're less faithful. But the reason why, as we'll see in the next slide, we're doing that is because that the businesses and the world really want to use models that are better. And unfortunately, there is some type of inverse 
relationship, as you'll see in this, that, that the accuracy, how good my model is, is really, really good with a neural network or a deep neural network, but it's very, very poor on my explicitness scale. And then I have what I would say you learn first machine learning things, decision trees or classification rules, which are the really basic ways of going about any prediction model. And they're very explicit and very understandable, but they're typically not gonna incorporate the complexity that you have in the real world. So unfortunately, some of the best models we have out there, ensemble methods and deep learnings, are also the ones that are the least explicit. So if I'm going to go out there and say, I need to have transparent methods, I'm going to come up with a huge legal battle that I'm never going to win in this world. And because of that, you're going to have people uh, with you know these justification ways. And you have to think about this, like what's the net benefit for humanity? And that's why Cynthia Rudin's talk is gonna be very interesting because I wanna see her try to outlaw neural networks or random forests. I just want to see her try. And I have the utmost respect for her, but there's no way I think that's ever going to happen because that's the actual implication of this slide. And I think she actually might agree with this slide, but it'll be really interesting to hear how she presents this story. Um, this is actually something from the famous Lime, or it's similar to something that Lime will, well, let's talk about this. So in the area of image processing, there are things called saliency maps that I have this little picture. I think that's a goat. I'm not even fully sure it's a goat. I don't think it's a sheep. Uh, and you have the desire for the system to tell you what is going on and why do I think this is a goat? And this is from someone's paper and it's a great paper. Uh, about how to use something called saliency maps. And it shows you, listen, this is a goat because of this. Look, 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 it's a goat. Everyone can see that, right? You see the red, you see the orange, you see the green, it's a goat. Uh, and, and, and I find this fascinating because if you're an image process, and I don't know if any of you are any of you image processing experts, uh, 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 any of you know, uh, they will swear that is clear as anything that that is a goat from that saliency map. However, many of us, me included, do not see that to be a goat. Uh, and there's actually an algorithm called Lime, which we mentioned earlier. Um, I forgot what Lime stands for. It's a really great paper and I do really strongly recommend you all look at it because it, it hits upon some of these issues. Uh, it talks about global and local interpretations. A local interpretation is something that only has to do with this specific uh, instance. So in this specific instance, and Lyme is typically local, you have this picture, which is, you know, a combination of all these different elements. You've got a dog, you got electric guitar, it seems like you got human hands playing it. And Lyme then tries to break it apart and give you its components and explain to you, well, this part of it is a Labrador, and this part of it seems to be acoustic guitar, and this part of it seems to be electric guitar. And what Lyme is really good at is taking apart um, a local instance of something, a specific instance of something, and then telling you what makes it what it thinks it is. Um, I'm not really sure though, that if I showed this to a human, a regular human on the street, they would actually say, oh, that's a good explanation for electric guitar, or oh, that's a really good explanation for acoustic guitar. Unless of course they're familiar with image processing and the like. On the other hand, if I just give you a decision tree and I say, is this person fit? And I say, well, if they're younger than 30, then, you know, unless they're eating lots of pizzas, they're fit. But if they're more than 30, they gotta exercise all the time or else they're not gonna be fit. And then you say, well, that's a really easy model for me to understand. Humans typically will want things like this and won't want things like this. But the problem is most models are easier to generate explanations along these lines. Are there any questions on that before I go on? For the goat example of the saliency map, couldn't you hypothetically like then do kind of similar to what Lyme does. So maybe you don't directly use the saliency map as the explanation, but you're like, we highlight these parts based on the saliency map to say this was a goat. Like, yeah, and you can have different things. Uh, and, and I think that that's a great idea. My problem isn't with doing that particularly. My question really is um, how much would the average mortal understand it? And then the question becomes what kind of output are you generating and how human friendly or expert friendly is it are, are you following where i'm going with that yeah so it's just like 
you want the average person to make sense of it, not just the domain expert, I guess. Exactly. I'm sorry. The, my, your someone's chat. Oh, here you go. Yeah. Okay. So, Bijan, Bijan. I'm sorry. I'm not pronouncing that name right. I don't think. Um, so, I don't fully understand the question, though. Even though I did read it about the goat. Do you want to unmute and try to tell me? No. Okay. All right. David. Yeah. Uh, Abi. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah, I had a. Another question um, sure. with regards to the uh, plot you had earlier um, oh. in terms of predictability and explainability. Yeah, that one. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I guess I was just wondering, is there a reason why there's this almost like negative exponential curve between like, prediction accuracy and explicitness? So that's a good question. <laughs> Not a great question according to my, my definition of questions. Uh, I didn't make a slide about that question, but I think I know the answer. Um, and I don't think I'm purely speculative. Um, I don't know if you've encountered the bias versus variance trade-off with a lot of yeah. machine learning models, uh, but the idea basically is um, both ensemble and deep learning are really able to dig in with very, very complex fittings to the data. And because they're really able to dig in with very, very complex fittings to the data, they're inherently very, very complex models. And because of that, they're inherently very, very good models for a lot of situations. But what makes something explicit? What makes something explicit is how easy are those things for a human to understand. And if I have a very, very complex model, by definition, it's less explicit. By the way, you can actually argue that decision trees aren't inherently explicit either. Meaning if I have a very, 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 very big decision tree with millions of rules, I don't have a good explicit decision tree either. It's not a function necessarily of the model. It's a function whether or not this model is very complex. And that actually has to do with one of the things that I need to get to soon because that has to do with how do I evaluate it. And the question really might be how many rules do I have instead of, you know, what base learning I'm really dealing with. And it might be more a function of how many features I'm considering or how complex my output model is or these types of things. Those are things that I've been starting to, to really look into. So I, I should really get going uh, because I see from thinking I'd only speak for like 20 minutes, I, I like burning through lots of time, which is great because I really am passionate about this. But I want to talk about the next idea, which is um, something I've been thinking about really along the lines of what David mentioned is that it's not necessarily the learning model which makes something explicit or not. It's do I understand the connection between the input and the output? And one way to make the connection between the input and the output really clear is in a very old trick called feature selection. Uh, where I basically take a whole bunch of uh, attributes, and I assume, right, is it fair to say you've all seen feature selection in some form already? It's, yeah. That you take a whole bunch of things and feature selection, you typically look for the connection. So A2 here has a yes, and the category is a yes, and A2 has a yes here, and here's a yes, here's a no, and here's a no, uh, as opposed to A1 where I can't really make any sense. All right, low value here is yes, High value here is also yes, and in between value is no, so I can't really understand the connection. So in the simplest arena of feature selection, you simply use only those features that really uh, have a strong connection. And in theory, if you could use only those features where something was clear, the, the connection, then David, maybe I could go back to deep learning and use it and then understand what's going on because I have an inherent understanding about the input and the output connection. And all the deep learning is, is it's sh sharpening those connections that I already basically already understood. But on the other hand, if my input has, you know, 1 million different data points, uh, different features, then there's no way because deep learning is going to do some crazy thing and, you know, exclude certain things and not others with different weights and I'm not going to get what's going on. So I, I like your point. I agree with your point very strongly that it's not necessarily the models, but more about what you're doing. And one way of preventing you from getting bogged down is just by uh, dealing with the input itself. Uh, the next question I think is important to focus on is when do I want to present this? Is this something that I just do before? like as motivation, getting back to Scott's question about, you know, motivation or justification, as long as I justify it before, I'm, I'm good to go. I have convinced you that I'm doing well. Uh, you will now leave me alone from the legal GDPR, or whatever it is, from the, the regulatory authorities and, you know, get off my back. Uh, you know, if I really want to inspire trust, I'll tell you while I'm making a decision that, you know, this is really good or whatever it is. But 
Um, transparent models are very good for during the task, but that's only if you really need that type of information. Uh, and the method you're using to generate that information will impact when you want to prevent it, present it. So again, the feature selection might be very good for both before or after, because if I could take a few features and create some type of intuition, yes, this is really connected to the target. Uh, that will be very good for before. And then during tax ex tax execution, I could show you some type of visualization of what's going on. However, some of the tools which are external to the model are only post-mortem, as they say, post-talk, only after it. This might only be important for legal experts or experts, but not necessarily for the people that are looking for trust or the things they're looking for during the... You need some not only theoretical idea, but you need to really have some studies to che check these things. And the studies are only starting now to be looked at. So, so this is something that's very active and being looked at, but we really have to think about what we're trying to check. Um, and getting back to David's question, uh, I really think that explanations have to be thought of in a whole bunch of different ways. Agent prediction is important, but it's only one of the elements here. Uh, and we want to then try to quantify what is a good interpretation. And, and David's intuition, and I'm, maybe I'm taking reading too much in what David's intuition is, is it's not necessarily the model, but the complexity of that interpretation or in that model might give us some understanding for how to quantify what's going on. And that's something that I, I'll talk about a little bit more because it's one of the things I'm actively researching. And then you can talk also about for explanations themselves, I'm talking about users. And I want to quantify the user acceptance, and I'll have to do that in some way. And then you can have some type of weight, weighted sum, a product, weighted, whatever it is, sum, product, whatever it is. But just tell the people, tell the people out there in the world what you're trying to do and what why you're trying to do it, and then create some type of weighted sum for dealing with all the different things. So just to flush this out a little bit more. Agent performance, we I think we all know. You've got accuracy, you've got recall, you've got precision, right? Please nod with me. You, you've heard all these things before. You've got F scores, you've got whatever it is, um, rock curves, whatever it is that makes you happy in the machine learning world. On the other hand, um, I don't know, have you guys ever gone through a true HCI course where you talk about the NASA TLX and and S S U S scores and things like that. I think computer scientists are not as good about dealing with this. And by the way, these are computer science papers. I actually linked these things. And Matt, if you want afterwards, we can put these slides up where they can link through these to these things if they want to. Um, uh, this is a very much subset of computer science called human computer interactions. And they have their own literature about this. And it's not something that we typically say. And the idea behind NASA TLX is um, task load. Oh, I don't remember what, oh, here it's tax load index. That's where the X comes from. Uh, and the idea is like, how happy are you with what's going on? How bothered do you feel by the system? And does the explanation really provide you too much information or not enough information? And there's actually a great study by a group of Microsoft which shows that giving the user too much information is not very good uh, for this reason. Although they don't think they necessarily say for this reason. And it's something that we have to think about. Uh, there are other scales for human computer studies. Uh, there's a SUS scale, and there's an entire, I would say, um, subset of computer science that thinks about it. Pro one of the problems is that what, are you, what domain are you looking at? Are you just like ad hoc saying, I think it's good? Or are you looking at the same problem that other people are looking at and really saying something general? And unfortunately, no canonical problems exist, at least that I know of, and it's something that we're going to have to think of going forward. So the agent side, what I was mentioning before, is unfortunately usually this inverse proportion, that you've got your high accuracy, but then you really should be penalizing on the explicitness. And then the question is how to go about um, um, penalizing it. And, and the question also becomes like, what should the relationship be? Is it like, you know, every percentage point of accuracy should be weighted with X amount of units of explicitness and how do you measure your X units of explicitness and, and you have a huge mess, in my opinion, because no one's really quantified uh, these terms uh, and it's something that we're going to have to do going forward. 
and when I say going forward, I of course mean it's something that I'm doing right now, uh, not as we're speaking, but literally I have students working on how to think about doing these things right now. And it's something that I think is really, really cool because it's a really hot field and it's something we should be thinking about. So this is how we segue into this slide. You have to think about how faithful your explanation is. And it could be binary, by the way, especially if you're Cynthia Rudin. I really want her to get up and say it. Like, if this system is not faithful, it is useless. And you cannot legally use it. And that would be awesome because that would be like, you know, you can have the best accuracy in the world, but it would be legally wrong to use this automated radiologist, right? You have now um, machine learning, deep learning experts that can look at a, a CT scan or MI scan and make a diagnosis with higher accuracy than the world's biggest experts. But it could be still illegal to use it according to what she's saying. And that becomes a really interesting and sticky thing because machine learning is typically focusing on things that are not faithful and are not explicit. And then according to my argument here, it might actually be illegal. But focusing back on uh, what David was maybe saying is it's not necessarily the model itself that's problematic, it's the number of rules. And if I can then look at the number of rules in the model, then I can quantify how interpretable it is, and then I can come up with some type of weighting. And one of the other things uh, that we've been looking at is something called stability, which is how likely are you to get the same results from two slightly different data sets? And this is a concept of stability. I don't think you guys have necessarily met stability before. Have you met stability? Um, the basic idea behind stability is if I have a list of predictions and then I have another data set with a list of predictions, how much do they agree with each other? And stable models will always agree with each other and unstable models will not. And one of the problems is if you have a hyper parameterized model, you'll have less stability typically, and that's bad. So you could actually quantify things like stability and that could give you an indication for how interpretable it is, even though these models were not made for interpretability, it was made for something else, but it might give you insight for the same. I'm still gonna say canonical problems exist. So it's not clear what we need to be looking at. Um, so just some ideas that, I mean, you know, Matt and I are friends, so I could tell you what we're, we're talking about. We're looking at in my group, the people that are working with me. Uh, one of the things we've been looking at is has to do with uh, what David mentioned. It's not necessarily the type of learning that you're using, but it's the type of input that you're using. And one of the tricks that we've been looking at is to create what are called feature ensembles, things that you're really convinced are good features to be looking at, and then only creating your models around those features. And even though you're kind of tying a hand or two or three or five behind your back, at least though you're going to get a whole bunch of other things which are that you're going to be more accurate. Uh, application domains are really important. Medicine is just one of the things I've been looking at. Um, teamwork and collaboration settings are super, super important. And it's really going, and there are so many papers that people start looking in negotiation and um, tutoring systems even, Matt, I've seen a whole bunch of things. And then the question also is, what do you show? What type of interfaces do you need? What type of user studies can you do? What is a good explanation? And in theory, you can learn this implicitly by user feedback that they say, I like this, I don't like this. And getting back, I'm sure to something that's close to Matt's heart, and I don't know if he's looking at this, but everything I've talked about is what's called one-shot supervised learning. And one of the major things that we have to look about look at is reinforcement learning is out there as one of the major unknown, unexplored areas. Like what happens, what is an explanation of something that's going on over the course of a lot of learning cycles? And what would that even look like? Is it is it just like, you know, a feature map or a saliency map? Or what would that even look like over time? And what would explanations even mean for unsupervised learning? And I don't think it necessarily can be define, but then I think for semi-supervised it should be. And then the question is, what would that look like and what would the interplay? And I think there's a lot of very good places that people can focus their energy to really flush out a lot of these things in the future. So, so this is a really cool area, in my opinion, with a lot of very good places to be looking at. Uh, just, just for one practical takeaway, you know, set of results type of thing so we can make this a little bit more com concrete. Um, my mom is a good mother and she loves me dearly. She has very little clue, however, about artificial intelligence. 
and for many, many years, she she would ask me what I'm doing, and she would patiently listen, and then she would nod, maybe even sometimes. And then a few years ago, I actually met a whole bunch of really great doctors in London, and they're like, oh, you're an AI person. Would you like to look at cancer data? I'm like, cool. <laughs> Never really thought about that before, but if you're offering it, I'll take a look. And um, what I found out is actually cancer isn't so hard to predict as long as you've got good enough data. Uh, I'm a little flippant about it, but um, uh, they're usually very happy with like 80% accuracy. And from a machine learning perspective, 80% accuracy isn't typically even so good. So when you give them like, you know, a 5% bump up in the accuracy with doing some clever learning, they're like super excited. And you're like, oh yeah, I just looked at your data. Uh, but I don't necessarily even understand what I'm looking at a lot of the time, which I don't necessarily see as a problem. But to be quite honest, this explainability work grew out of that. Because a lot of times I would say things that were absolutely ridiculous from their perspective. Uh, and they would just laugh at me at the beginning. I didn't understand what these, I was looking at genomic uh, enzymes and stuff and I had no idea what I was saying. And, and I would say things like, it seems like for breast cancer, the BRCA gene is important. And they're like, yeah, join the club. We knew that 20 years ago. And they would just literally laugh at me. Uh, I'm like, well, I didn't know that. But uh, so I looked at a bunch of cancers, including prostate cancer, different data sets for it. And what was actually very interesting is that some of the models were actually contradictory. All of them seemed to be working quite well, but they would all pick up on different features. And then the question then becomes, and this actually is a really scary thing, if I actually go out and, and create some type of panel for predicting cancer, and I'm basing myself on models that I know in my heart of hearts is really not always working, then what have I really done? And Feature analysis is one of the tricks that I've used in that only stick to the features that are always showing up as being important, always showing through feature selection approaches. And that's what I mean by the stability that you can really count on these features for being important and then create your models accordingly. And it actually might be a little worse in a given data set, but if you look at it across many different data sets, you'll actually get something that's better. And then you have to talk about whether or not I'm willing to sacrifice a certain amount of um, accuracy in theory for something that just makes more sense. And we were looking at this for esophageal cancer, for colon cancer. Uh, we have, I now have a nice collaboration with the UCL Medical School where they just basically feed me data, which is, as I don't know if you guys know, a huge commodity in this world is finding someone that can feed you good, clean data because, you know, they'll have 15 people working full time on a data set and then, you know, we'll just look at it for a few days and come up with something. But the month of time it took them to generate that data is is overwhelming. Um, We've looked at this, that knowledge discovery might be better if you look at smaller numbers of features. The explanation might be more reliable, but there is almost definitely some trade-off between accuracy and this explainability approach, because I'm inherently throwing out data. And then the question then becomes, getting back to what David uh, kind of filled me on, how many features is too many features, right? And, and should I be looking at the model or just the input? Is 10 features too much? Is five features too much? Is it 50? Shouldn't it depend on the learning model and the output? And just by, you know, 10 features, not more than that, that's all I really want to do. Uh, I really don't necessarily want to work things that way. And the question is, what's better to do? Um, and we've started looking at these things just by quantifying them that I have, and this is just a very high level uh, approach, but this is the percentage of the features I'm trying to use. Uh, so I'm using only 10% of the features up to 50% of the features. And what you see over here is that no matter what I do, if I'm using fewer features, I want to quantify that as being more explainable. And in this work, we just define explainability of what percentage of the features I'm using. Uh, but on the other hand, I'm going to get lower accuracy. So there are many ways to weight things. One of them is um, the harmonic mean, which is some type of average between the two. And it's something that this is just meant to give you a high level understanding that unfortunately, there's no magic bullet here that there is a trade off between the accuracy I'm going to get and the number of features in my model. And I'm probably going to want some type of harmonic mean, but no one's really defined what harmonic mean. And the harmonic mean is, for those of you that don't know, it's a, it's an F measure. It's this times this times two divided by this plus this. Yeah, 
think I said that right. But there are many ways of weighting different things, uh, and and I don't claim to have the uh, magic bullet. So just to take some takeaway thoughts and things, and then I'd love to take some more questions. Um, think about explainability. Not all things are equally explainable. A justification is not the same as a transparent model. Um, legalities are going to become very, very important if you ask me in the future. Uh, literally, the future of humanity might depend on it, although I would like to believe not. But it's definitely something that we should be building into our AI understanding uh, that you have a model. And not only do you have a model that's good, you can actually explain to this someone else who's not necessarily an AI expert why it's good. And then the question is how you do that, how do you generate that information, when do you present it, uh, and, and why are you interested in doing that in the first place? Uh, I'd like you to consider hybrid methods where you sometimes pick and choose from different elements given the um, problem and the models at your disposal and the importance of explainability. You can use feature analysis. That's one of the tools in my toolkit that I really like using, but you can also use that in conjunction with other things. Uh, and I made a link to the um, from archive from this uh, JMS paper, although I think it's publicly available too. But um, I'm very happy to put these slides up and there are some links put in there. And I'm also very happy after this talk to, to be in touch with any of you for any questions you might have. So I think with that, I'm done for now. But I'd like so, to take some questions, Matt, if that's okay. Yeah, that'd be awesome. Um, the slides are in Discord, so people have access to all of these links. I'm going to send you, I actually changed them this morning, so I'm going to oh, send you an updated one. Okay. Um, and then <laughs> I wanted to mention that last week, Borealis AI went public with the DeepRL stock trading agent we were working on. And they also said how uh, explainability was a key component of it. So I can't, I can't talk about any details yet. Hopefully the full patent will be filed next spring and I can talk about the details, but I can say that uh, it, explainability in RL is something I have worked on and continuing to work on. There you go. And by the way, um, my family has been hounding me for the longest time to do uh, time series trading with stocks because they really believe that this should be doable. And it's good to hear that you've made the undoable doable. <laughs> so it was, I, I helped. Shouldn't say it was me. But I will, I will say also my dad has been poking me for years to do cool stuff with the stock market, which totally makes sense. He also at one point when I was doing more robotics said I should put a laser on a robot to help cut the grass. So not, not all of my dad's <laughs> ideas are, are home runs. Is it profitable for you? Just out of the aside. I, I mean, do you have your own money actually being traded by an agent and making no. a profit on some of them? No, it's uh, other people's money. Other people much more important than me. But are, are is their money making uh, growing with this? Oh agent? yeah, they they wouldn't be using it if existing non RL methods were outperforming there it. There you go. There you go. Good for them. Great. Well, thank you so much, Avi. This is awesome. Um, I've you. got a bunch of questions, but I'm sure students have questions and comments too. So I'm going to shut up and let some of them unmute. Okay. <laughs> Hi, Avi. Uh, Hi. Good talk. Michael, um, right? I was, Thanks. Yes. Yeah, I was a bit confused um, in the parts of your presentation where you said like, oh, this model would be illegal or this model would make it legal. And I was wondering if you could explain that because maybe you did say it and I just completely missed it. Um, I think it really has to do with what would make something legal. Uh, and, and the argument I'm trying to make, I'm sorry, Michael, did you want to flesh out the question? I'm sorry, I got so excited. Oh, no, I was just, I guess I was kind <laughs> of looking for like, what is this boundary line of legality that you keep seem to be referring to throughout the presentation, right. but I wasn't sure right. if you actually had defined it. It doesn't exist right now. Let me just okay. make that very clear. The, the borderline, so Cynthia made an argument that there should be such a line uh, that's this paper here. Uh, the line doesn't exist right now. Even though there's this GDPR, it's very ambiguous and they don't say how much explanation do you need to be, you know, in compliance with this GDPR. Um, what I believe eventually could be done and has not been done yet, you might say only transparent models are legal. And, and if you take, I think, Cynthia's logic to its extreme, that might be one way to go. You have to have it completely explicit, where you have a complete link between the logic of the agent 
and the decision being made and nothing else. Um, I can't imagine that that will actually happen, but it's definitely a possibility. Okay, cool. Thank you. So I guess like when you were saying, oh, this would be illegal, it was more skeptical like speculative then yeah, yeah. yeah. If, okay. if you would actually so the truth is a simple reading of the eu's gdpr would seem to imply that you are required to do transparent models but no one that i've met from the ai community in the eu actually thinks that that has any teeth you're following me like they they just I don't know. I don't know. I, it's not clear that the people writing those laws necessarily understood enough about the AI technologies to make that differentiation. And I don't know. I think Matt knows someone named Mike Woldridge, who is uh, out of Oxford. And he goes in front of the UK Parliament from time to time just to try to explain these things before they make the laws, because the people making the laws don't always necessarily know the technology. And then they might make a statement which sounds good, but it doesn't necessarily mean anything practically because they didn't necessarily use the terminology. So in order for a law to really be binding, you would first have to have a semantic range that's accepted. And part of the point of this paper a year ago is that the semantic range hasn't even been accepted. So even if they say it has to be transparent, they might not necessarily agree with what the definition of transparency is, let alone you know, actually mean that. You're following me? So so when I'm using it, it's in a very yeah, non-precise way. It could be made illegal if the powers that be would decide it should be made illegal. I see. So it's kind of like the interpretation is open-ended. Um, so it has yet to be fleshed out in that capacity. A hundred percent. And it's something I would hope that will become uh, thought about in a in a legislative sense but i can't imagine based on my experience as a human on the planet that the legislators on this planet will actually do something like that so i'm not overly optimistic as a human but i think it would be good if people would do that okay thank you sure any other questions i'm really curious about how oncotype dx managed to retain profitability like what's what's to stop like for example a public lab in canada just using their genes that they've identified maybe making a tiny alteration to them and then just running oncotype canada so i actually heard a lecture in israel of someone who was involved with making the oncotypes panel and that's why i'm smiling because i was just dying to know how they did it uh, and basically, they give you enough information to say what genes they're looking for, but they don't tell you. So the trick in medicine is it's not only about the feature that you're looking at, but of course, it's the values for that feature. And, and in medicine, especially, it's about how you pre-process the data to get that range of values. So they basically told you that we're looking at these features. And they told the entire world we're looking at these features. But if you're an external lab, in theory, you wouldn't know how to process the data to get those values for the features. It's almost like this cryptography little game where they tell you what the different keys are, but you can't actually. Uh, it's, it's a little strange. But on the other hand, I think that any lab in the Western world that started using those features in conjunction or separate to create a panel would get challenged on a patent basis by Oncotype. So even though I think it would be impossible to do it, they're still covered, I think, by the patent nonetheless. And I'm talking as someone that actually tried to, well, I, I think it still exists. They, they, I was one of the co-authors on a patent that had a similar type of panel for, like, I think it was prostate cancer or colon cancer. I have one for each. And I can tell you, they just basically throw everything into the patent and say, you know, I want this, I want this, I want this, I want this. And they don't actually explain how they use all of them. So the point is, if someone actually makes a panel that even comes close to being similar, they'll just fight them in, in court. And then it, it probably pays for both parties to settle or something like that. But yeah. So I was fascinated by the same thing because I assumed that, oh, it's obvious. Of course, you can just, but no, it's not. <laughs> That's cool. It's this it's this weird middle path that they're treading where they're explainable, but not really. 
Well, you don't want something purely transparent. And that goes back to the same thing uh, that, that you and that's why I kind of put feature analysis here in the middle in that you're basically giving some type of understanding what's going on. But the normal mortal won't necessarily know what's going on from it. Uh, but on the other hand, you can then, in an independent lab, look at these markers and see if there is some kind of correlation between cancer and non-cancer. So, so you can independently verify kind of what's going on, but you won't necessarily be able to adjust. I mean, what Oncotype does, from what I understand, for those of you that don't know, is you can give them a biopsy of a cancer and they'll tell you what path of treatment and how certain they are about that path of treatment or, or all these different types of things. So let's say someone has a breast cancer, they have a biopsy done. I think Oncotype started with breast cancer. And then they'll say, you know, you have the following genes, we suggest the following aggressive treatment whatever it may be. Or, you know, they can say, listen, don't even do anything. For prostate cancer, by the way, they say it's one of the cancers you die with, you don't necessarily die from. So an oncotype test could tell you which kind of cancer it is. Is it one of the ones that you really have to be concerned? But you can then verify that that marker is important, but you won't necessarily be able to verify their model. And you're paying for the model as much as you are for the medical understanding of what's going on. You following me? So that's why I kind of put feature analysis here in the middle, as opposed to, by the way, if I just make some type of nice, pretty tool saying, you know, the, the model says you should do this, then I really haven't necessarily said anything, but it looks, you know, convincing on some level. But you can run into this problem in multiple places, like in finance. If if you're going to uh, invest in someone, they better convince you that they're really smart and have a good technique but they're not going to tell you all the details or you could just replicate it. So trying to figure out how, how explainable or transparent you want to be in order to make a sale versus giving away secrets. Or justification. And that's why I put justification kind of in its own category because you haven't necessarily, you know, believe me, I'm smart is justification. It doesn't really give the person technical information that they can necessarily action based on that. But uh, but that is a good justification. Or believe this model is accurate 99% of the time in independent tests. It's great justification, but isn't necessarily explainable. And we might get to a point, by the way, that that's all we need legally too. And um, I, I think Michael asked about that. You know, what's the legal requirement? I'm willing to put serious money that if anything is ever passed, it's going to be okay just to provide justification because. And, and even Google, Microsoft, Facebook, they'll all be fine with, you know, believe my model, I'm right 90 something percent of the time, uh, because it's in everyone's best interest to, to say that if it's true, and then they'll be justifiable. Other questions, Matt, do you see, or? So one one of my questions then um, sure. was the the thing that bothers me about a lot of explainability research is they the end results is, is an explanation. It is not how someone can use that explanation to take some action. And it seems like if you are if you're not so just like you you need to consider the kind of person you're talking about, you need to think what is that explanation being used for? If it's going to increase trust, you should measure it. If it's going to let the user better predict how the agent would act, then you need to trust whether those predictions get better. Is do you do you think that's you you just moved to a slide, so I'm guessing you have something to say about that. Well, I moved to the reasons why explanations are important. And if you're trying to provide justification so the human participant can decide to accept them, then the 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 trust metric should be what percentage of the time did the human accept them versus without the you can you can measure that meaning it should be actionable and then the quantification for the explanation should be did you have the human accepting the suggestions more often um, if it's trust i would say ask the person before and after how much they trust the system in some type of legitimate human agent system. And I think what you're saying is based on the reason for the explanation, 
you should, in theory, be focused on measuring the motivation element, the motivational element. And if if you fail to improve on the motivational element, then it's great that you're saying you want explanations, but you haven't provided the goods, so to speak. Exactly. And I've seen many papers on explainability that the end result is an explanation. There are no humans in the paper. They, they never actually evaluate the explanations with real people. They just say, here's our picture or here's our data set. Look, isn't it good? And I'm willing to bet that a lot of those people are coming from the machine learning community which is the people, and that goes back, and this is what actually drove me somewhat batty at the beginning. Their definition of an explanation is really what I call an interpretation. And because of that, they're not interested in measuring what we call an explanation because you're looking at it from the aspect of a different community. You're following me? And that's what literally drove me a little bad because I was having conversations with these people and, and they're, they're wonderful, wonderful researchers. We were just using different syntax for intending to say the same thing. And even to this day, and that's why I want people to cite the paper, even if they disagree with it, because at least that means you've read it, or, or you want to address it, or you want to think about it, because you have to use terminology that's consistent with other people's terminology, and understand that certain people will define an explanation differently than you. And that's what kind of drove me a little batty about this field. Uh, it's, I, and by the way, I was curious when I was seeing people citing it, I'm like, oh great, they're finally doing what I want them to do. And no, they weren't necessarily looking at the definitions, they were citing other pieces of it. Because I really was hoping that these interpretation people would start adopting a more uniform, and I've seen papers that say, um, we're going to use transparency interpretation explanations synonymously because we saw that in this paper. And I'm like, no, please don't do that because they, they're meant to be different. At least according to the English language, they're meant to be different. But let's create some uniform definitions for it. So I think your point is very, very good. And that it's an inherent problem with trying to cookie cutter explanations, including what I'm saying about measuring the number of features, because the question really is, what are you trying to measure and have you measured it correctly? Which I think is a great point. Also for my own work, by the way, you can take one of the directions I'm doing and, and critique it for that reason. So that's a great comment for that reason too. Well, just like I, I always say, we need to stop doing reinforcement learning in video games and almost all my research is on reinforce, all my students' research is on <laughs> RL and video games. <laughs> Yes, because it's easy to do reinforcement learning in video games because it's easy to do reinforcement in video games, which is why we have, but, but you have a canonical problem. That's what's nice about reinforcement learning, meaning uh, the, from you to the alpha go people are all looking at a series of things that are, you know, accepted as a legitimate yardstick. And even though there's simplifications of the real world, they're seen as simplifications of the real world. Uh, I don't see that happening in the explanation field so soon because it's inherently more a human driven thing. And the problem with human driven things is it's probably going to take a lot longer for us to decide on a canonical data set, but it's something we really need to think about. Well, why, I guess I don't understand, is it, is it a problem of people disagree on what a canonical data set is? Yes. Is it, okay. Yes, um, there's an entire, um, I don't know how many of you or your students are involved with the, the CHI community, uh, computer, computer who, uh, a CHI study is typically very domain specific and very uh, focused on the interaction in that domain. And <laughs> there's very little transfer learning. I hate to be so technical. Transfer learning going on where they say, oh, this is something that exists in all the different Domain is this something that we should be looking across all. And, and I would love that community to say, listen, these are the elements you always need to look at, no matter what the problem is that you want to look at. Uh, and and I, it would almost be like saying to, to a psychologist, this is how you can quantify any human on the face of the planet. And it's very hard because humans are very hard to quantify that way. 
and video games have scores and humans don't really have scores the same way uh which is why it's easier to look at video games than humans but on the other hand that's part of the joy or challenge with dealing with human research I'm waxing philosophic i'm sorry <laughs> completely appropriate <laughs> Awesome. Any, any, other questions? any other questions? Okay. Awesome. So what happens now? I just send you the slides. Uh, I think I'm then going to sign off and I appreciate the opportunity to speak to you guys and meet all of you. And um, if, if Cynthia does speak there and any of you want to send a line after that, I'd appreciate that because I'm really curious what she says or doesn't say. But um, I think this is going to be one of those things that just kind of stays out there for a while as one of these important areas. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for coming, Avi. Uh, we thank will do you. our best to make sure everyone uses at least either uses your terminology or at least clearly defines their own terms in their papers. Thanks. I would appreciate uh, that. <laughs> um, but you know, you you came a, he a hemisphere away just for this lecture, so I, I really appreciate it. <laughs> No problem at all. And I think I'm going to sign off then. So best of best of uh, continued research and the rest of this course to all of you. Awesome. Good night, Avi. Uh, good night. I'm going to try to close this. Bye-bye. <laughs>